thee. Hide me when the storm is raging or life's trouble see. Like a dove on ocean's billows, oh, let me fly to thee. Hide me, hide me, oh, blessed Savior, hide me, oh, Savior, keep me safely, O oh Lord, with thee. Hide me when the heart is breaking with its weight of woe. When in tears I seek thy comfort, thou canst alone bestow. Hide me, hide me, O oh, blessed Savior, hide me, O oh, Savior, keep me safely, O oh Lord, with thee. If you would mark your hymnals to page 23, that will be our invitation song after our speaker completes his thoughts for tonight. Turn now with me to page 351. Troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Street upon all hold dear, now is at stake. Humbling your heart to God, saves from the chastening rod. Seek the way pilgrims trot, Christians awake. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. All of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies. Going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Troubles will soon be your happy forevermore when we meet on that shore free from all care. Rising up in the sky, telling the world goodbye, homeward with then will fly glory to share. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their droom, troopers will shroom. All of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. I have uh, about four announcements here very quickly before we will dismiss our kids to Bible classes. Sympathy is expressed to Jane Coyle and her family at the passing of her mother, Betty, Betty Jane Weiss, this past Friday. Her service was here today. Also sympathy to Becky Nelms and her family at the passing of her uncle, C.T. Goad, who passed away on Sunday morning in Colorado. 
asked to pray for safety and travel as the Nelms travel there for the funeral services. Also sympathy to Ted Mitchell, his brother Stan, sisters Penny and Nancy, and their family at the passing of his mother, Fern, on Monday afternoon. Memorial services will be Saturday, July 11th at 10 o'clock in the morning at Mulkey Mason here in Louisville. Also some reminders that OWLS camper applications are due on Sunday, June the 28th. And also a reminder that tomorrow that Barbara Smith's group will be going to Christ Haven for a work day at the barely used shop. The bus will leave the building at nine o'clock in the morning and return by 3.30 in the afternoon. That's all the announcements that I have. At this time, I'd like to uh, dismiss the children and the Bible class teachers to go to their classes. And then here in just a moment, I'll come back up and introduce our speaker of the hour. I'm very excited to be able to introduce our speaker of the hour. I'm very excited that Brother Sam Dilbeck will be speaking to us this evening. His bio states he's a native Oklahoman, which is always a good start. Sam married his high school sweetheart, Julie, and moved to Austin, Texas to attend the Southwest School of Biblical Studies. After graduation, Sam and Julie moved to Granite, Oklahoma to work with the church there for two years. Their first son, Jason, was born while they lived there. Following their work in Granite, the family moved to Leonard, Texas, where he served for 11 years, and their second son, David, was born. Sam currently works with the West Hill Congregation in Corsicana, where he has just started his ninth year of ministry. In addition to preaching, Sam enjoys graphic design, historic reading, and cooking. Sam chose Psalm 107 because it reveals God's blessings in rescuing us from the exile of our sins. I was trying to remember exactly when we first met, and he was so gracious to put on here. Uh, alternate bio that Sam met, met Jeff in 1994, and we met in 1995. And he says, and I read it here, then the excitement began, all because he met Jeff and I. But now nah, he is a wonderful man, he's a wonderful father, he's a wonderful minister and preacher. And I knew as we were looking at putting together this series over the psalm, I knew that I wanted him here, that I wanted this congregation, our church family here, to be able to hear what he has to say. Uh, I've been bragging on you, and so I know you won't let me down, show him your, uh, how friendly we are. Uh, but I also would encourage you to open your Bibles to the 107th psalm. As that's where the text will be uh, from this evening, the 107th Psalm. Again, teenagers, you will remain in here this summer, which is a great thing. I encourage you also to take notes because I know there's going to be a, a wealth of biblical information and application shared with us. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Brother Sam. First of all, I want to say how much I appreciate the invitation to be here. My wife and my youngest son, David, are, are able to be here. I'm so thankful for that as well. Uh, Kevin mentioned that we've known each other 94, 95, 20 years or so. And my son is quick to point out that Kevin still looks 18. <laughs> and apparently I don't. What a wonderful study when we start talking about the Psalms. To identify the worship life of the nation of Israel. 
to see their praise and their adoration toward God, to recognize how they loved him, how they came to him, how they viewed him. If you ever want to really deepen your prayer life, to enrich your personal study of the Bible and your adoration toward God, spend times in the Psalms. Daily, read those psalms. A friend of mine, not long ago, he, he, uh, we, we always, for our birthdays, well, like on my birthday, I, I, I buy him a book, and on his birthday, he buys me a book. And After his birthday passed, I didn't get a book. I wasn't too disappointed. I thought, you know, we're getting old enough now. We probably don't need to exchange gifts and play this game anymore. And, uh, but I got a box in the mail, and I remember bringing it in, in and, and looking at it and and it was, it was a copy of the Psalms, just the Psalms, really nice binding and everything. And I remembered putting this Bible, uh, you know, in the checkout box or checkout card online, you know, and it was a pre-publication. And, and then, you know, it was kind of expensive, so I decided, you know, I, I really don't need to splurge on that. So I took it out of the cart, and then I'd convinced myself that I... I didn't take it out of the cart and actually purchase this book. And I was flipping through, and I said, you know, it's a pretty good book. Well, about a month later, this friend of mine said, hey, did you get my uh, book? And I said, no. <laughs> well, I did. He actually bought it and sent it to me. And what a wonderful little book it is. I keep it on my desk, and I read from the Psalms every morning. And it, it is such a spectacular way to acquaint ourselves with God, the riches of his blessings, the loving kindness, which is a, a common theme throughout the psalm. And certainly we see it here in Psalm 107. When we talk about Psalm 107, we, we first identify it as the, the concept of being rescued from exile. When we read through it, you'll see that there is a common refrain throughout the, the psalm, especially in verses 4 through 32, as it repeats four parables, as some call them, four adventures, as others, call, others call, say it, but four situations of the exiled nation of Israel to appreciate the Israelites. They had been in Babylonian captivity for 70 years, warned right up to the very day that they were going to go in, because you have forsaken me, because you have left me, because you have done all of these things, you will go into exile separation from their homeland, separation from the house of God, the temple, separation from the most holy place, which was the presence of God, gone, out of their grasp, something that they had taken for granted so often. Seventy years of exile, though, and they were able to come home, to come back, to come back and, and lay again that foundation of the temple, to build again the house of God, to welcome once again the very presence of God within the worship life of Israel. They were excited. It is believed that Psalm 107, which starts the fifth book of the Psalms, was an exilic psalm or a post-exilic psalm, which means that it was written after that time in Israel. And it's a, it's a praise psalm. It's a psalm of thanksgiving unto God. Some have even referred to it as a, a thanksgiving wisdom psalm. If you've studied the psalms very long, and I'm sure in this process others have mentioned how the psalms are divided up into different categories like the, uh, the, the uh, praise psalms and thanks, thanksgiving psalms, the imprecatory psalms, and all of these different styles. But this one overlaps between the idea of thanksgiving and wisdom. What does it take to be wise? Which ends in, at the very, the, the very, very end of the psalm captures that idea of wisdom. But as we look at Psalm 107, uh, we see that the very first idea is this joy of reunion, to come back in, into the very presence of God. Let's begin in the first three verses, and I don't know if we'll have time to read the whole thing, but we'll do the best we can. He says, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gather from the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and to the south. As we look at these, these particular uh, uh, verses, we, we see one of the most amazing concepts, that of redemption. Think about who we were enslaved to sin and yet God has redeemed us Leviticus chapter 25 records for us the the uh, obligation of the the goel or the redeemer 
who when he saw his near kinsman going into debt was to swoop in and to pay off his debt. Or when the near kinsman had to go into indentured servitude, was, uh, had the opportunity to sweep in and, and, and take him out of that slavery. And then, of course, we see Jesus Christ himself as our great kinsman redeemer, seeing us in the predicament that we were in, to sw- swoop in with his grace and the shedding of his blood so that we might have redemption, this, this idea of buying back from the slavery. For the Jew and the mindset that they had, having come from exile to Babylon, it was such a sweet idea, redemption, a joyous reunion with God. And the call is, give thanks to God. Why? Well, for this, this redemption, for this reunion of joy. And let the redeemed say so. Let them speak of the greatness of God. Let them spell out those praises. Why? Because God has redeemed them. What did he do? He gathered them from the east and from the west, from the north and the south, the idea uh, that, that from everywhere, there is not a place that God was not able to reach out to those who would call upon him and save them from their exile. You imagine those 70 years, some prospered and some did not. Think of Daniel, and you think of prosperity. He is separated from his homeland, and yet God has moved him up the, la- the chain of command uh, to being one of the great presidents or satraps of the land of Babylon and, and also the, la- the, the, the Persian Empire. God has taken care of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they refuse to worship the idols. And they too are exalted into high positions. Others were were stuck out in the countryside like Ezekiel or Jeremiah. And they're enduring the hardships that come with exile. But no matter who they were, they were always mindful of Jerusalem. The great city. The city of God. You remember Daniel getting in trouble for praying in the direction of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. When they were entering the promised land for the first time, they were told to remember the city of Jerusalem and to turn their face toward it if ever they were in exile. The Jews would have done the very thing. But now, now God has reached out and he has brought them as as a people, as a remnant, back together into the city of Jerusalem from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. What a joyous reunion it was. Beginning in chapter 4, though, or verse 4, he starts to identify these different predicaments. The ESV translation that I use starts with, some wondered in verse 4. And then in verse 10, some sat in darkness. Then again in verse 17, some were fools. And then again in verse 24, I'm sorry, verse 23, some went down to the sea in ships. And the idea that that some have gathered from this is that when they were spread out through the Babylonian Empire, when they were in exile and separated from their homeland, that that some of them wandered through the desert wildernesses, and that some of the, the children of Israel had gone down into ships, and some were cast into prison, and and some were sitting in darkness. But The original language of the psalm doesn't carry that out at all. In fact, what it says is very directly, they wandered, that they sat, that they were fools. Fools have wandered, it says, or fools uh, through their sins. And then he says, those that go down. And the idea is that, not that there were some here, some here, and some here. But if you look at the predicament of Israel... Each one of these describes all the people. They were all wandering in desert wilderness. They were all in prison in some shape or form. They were all endangered of sickness. They were all in dangers and in perils of the sea. And each one is a metaphor for how they were separated from God and had forgotten who he was and the relationship that they had with him. Why this is important is because in each one of these, we see ourselves. In each one of them, we identify, maybe one with one more than the other, but each one is, 
is really describing mankind's predicament with sin, not just the nation of Israel in exile. Let's look at the first one, the idea of the wanderers that have been found. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their their souls fainted within them. Each one of these four predicaments follows the same idea of a calamity that befalls them. They cry out unto God, salvation is offered, and thanksgiving is commanded. And so here we see the first predicament. Some have wandered. The word wander here indicates that there is an aimlessness. There is no direction. We've seen that in people today. Some who maybe they graduate college and you ask them what they want to do and they don't know. You ask some people, you know, you've been out of school now for five years. Do you have any inkling of what you, I don't know. And we look at someone like that and we say, well, they're, they're aimless. They have no purpose in life driving them to a certain place. And that's the idea here. Israel was separated from God and without God as their, fer- or their focus, without God as their purpose, they were just wandering in the desert. And you know what a desert's good for? Getting across it. You know what you don't do in the desert? You don't meander around and take as long as you can to get through it. You don't take the scenic route through the desert. You get from point A to point B as quickly as possible because people die in the desert. But what happens is sometimes when we get stranded in the desert and we try to find our way out, and the sands and the dunes, they all begin to look the same after a while. As the sun beats down, it, 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 it tests our very resolve to get out, and we meander, and people die in the desert. And he said, these people were wandering in the wilderness or in the desert waste, finding no way. There was no direct route. They were just going back and forth listlessly. There was no city. Think about if you've ever driven across Arizona or through the deserts of California, how important a city was, a place to stop, a place to find protection, a place to get food, a place to get water, how important the civilization was in the midst of the wastelands of the desert. And he says they're wandering around and they can't find a place to connect with others and to give the body those things that are needed, finding no way to dwell or no city to dwell in. They're hungry and they're thirsty. And their souls, their spirits are fainted within them. They are distraught. If you've ever watched movies where they're, they're stumbling through the desert, and at first, you know, maybe they, they, they get lost and they, they start their walk and there's that, that marched resolve, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to the other side. And then, you know, the scene cuts and it comes back later and they're, they're stumbling through the sands of the desert until they fall and roll over and, and how the sun would rob them of, of hope. The nation of Israel was separated from God for so long, they, they, were, they were robbed of hope. And it says in, in verse 5 or verse 6, they, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. The word trouble here is, is the same as used in verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He has redeemed from trouble. The same concept of trouble here is the same concept of trouble that's going to be used throughout And it connects it all together. There was trouble in their lives. God had told them all along, if you you follow other gods, you'll be cut off. If you offer profane sacrifices, you'll be cut off. Because of their sin, they had been cut off. They had fallen into trouble and distress. Calamity has befallen them. And now, finally... In the midst of terror, in the midst of hopelessness, they cry out to God. It's almost like we do sometimes. We're wandering, aimless. And in those moments, we finally decide, I know where my hope is. My hope can come from God. The last straw, the the last measure of a, a hopeless man to call upon God 
And what happens? As they call upon God, He delivers them from their distress. One thing we see in Psalm 107 is that God is always ready to deliver us. In that moment, which we finally realize, I can't take another step without Him, God is there. Sadly, too often, we never come to that realization. Too many people continue to say, no, God, I've got this on my own. And they really don't. We see Israel in this wandering. We see ourselves in this wandering. But notice how he saves them in verse 7. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. You know what the straight way is? That's that direct route. Wherever they were in the desert, wherever they were lost and meandering, God gave them purpose and he delivered them straight by the hand as quickly as possible to the nearest city, the nearest place of refuge where they could find hunger. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love and for the wondrous works to the children of men. Another of the praises that is repeated in all four of these, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. God's love is endless. Even those who reject him, deny him, and hate him, God's love is still extended to them. One of the most well-known verses in the Bible, John 3.16, speaks of the love of God. For God so loved the world, a world that was lost in sin, a world that many of whom had no idea they had sinned. A world that had nothing to do with God. And yet God loved them because the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Lamentations 3. Let them thank God, the psalmist says. Thank God for His steadfast love. Thank God for his wondrous works to the children of man that God is constantly working on our behalf to bring us to bring us to the happy end. For he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Reminiscent of Jesus' statement, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled, Matthew 5 and verse 6. We were wandering, and God brought us home. But notice also, the prisoners are released. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in the irons. For they had rebelled against the word of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with labor. They fell down with none to help. Here's the calamity again. It's interesting to notice that in the first one, he says the world is so big and the world is so wide that the wanderers have become lost in the midst of it. And in this one, he says that their predicament is so bad they have been fettered in chains and locked behind iron bars. The gates of bronze have shut in on them, and they're in this cramped, tiny cage. And again, it's not as if he's saying some people are lost in the wide open and some are in prison. He says, we as mankind were both. How do you get lost in a world from a cramped cage? And yet that's where we were. Our sin had built up a wall of separation from us and God. Our sins had caused us to rebel against the very word of God. Notice in verse 11, they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Throughout the Old Testament, there's a phrase, El Elyon, which means God Most High. It's used by Moses, it's used by some of the prophets, it's used throughout the psalm, and here it's even used, although it's a bit separated, but God Most High, they, they rebelled against the words of God, they spurned the counsel of the Most High, El Elyon. Again, this phrase used for God. So he bowed their hearts down. Because of their rebellion, their sin, it has brought up on them this prison. They were bowed down in their hearts with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. No one was there. It's not that, it's not that God wasn't there to help. 
It's that they looked everywhere else for help and no one could help them. And it, it's, it's like when, when they were about to go into captivity in the exile in the first place and, and they started looking around for help. And they said, I, I know, we'll, we'll get Egypt. Egypt will help us. You know, through the years, yeah, they enslaved us, but, you know, in recent years, you know, they've been good friends to us. We'll get them to help us. God said, don't go to Egypt. I know, we'll get the, we'll get the Syrians to help us. Don't, don't go to Syria. And everyone they turned to, God said, no, don't, don't go to them. And the whole time, God was saying, come to me. Come to me. God will find any other way, but we're not coming to you. There was no one to help them. There was no one that had the power to help them. And so finally, they cried out in verse 13 again to the Lord because of their trouble. And this time it says that he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death. He burst their bonds apart. I'm reminded of Acts chapter 12 when Peter is sitting in the prison and the angel comes and, and the, the chains that are binding him are, are, are burst asunder and he's able to leave prison. God here again delivers us from our prison of sin. So let us thank God for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. For he shatters the doors of bronze and he cuts into the bars of iron. When God sets you free, there's nothing that can bind you. Jesus would say, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Knowledge of the truth, obedience to the gospel, to know it not just intellectually, but to know it intimately, to, to experience it. Experientially, to know the truth, we will be set free. And when God sets us free from our sins, nothing can bind us again. Oh, man may come by and put us in jail. He may put us in shackles. But our freedom is a freedom that passes all understanding, like the peace that God gives to us. We were wandering in the wilderness. We were locked up in a jail of sin. And God has released us from those bonds. Next, he speaks to those who were sick. Fools through their sinful ways and because of their iniquity suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. It's descriptive of one who is sick. If you've ever known those who, who have grown sick in their lives, maybe they, they're going through chemotherapy because of cancer, or maybe, uh, maybe their, their body is just uh, closing down or shutting down upon them, and you try to get them to eat. And they don't want to. They've lost their appetite. Food, it's not just that food doesn't taste good. They just don't want to eat. And so they don't eat, and the, the nutrition doesn't come into their body, and as a result, they get sicker. And when they feel even worse, they eat even less. And it's a downward spiral to the point of death, oftentimes. Because they just don't want to eat. He says that, that these were so sick, notice they, uh, uh, they, they didn't want anything to do with food. They loathed any kind of food in verse 18. And they drew near to the gates of death, to that shadow of death that he mentioned to those who were in prison. They're drawing close to it. They're sick by their sins. And then what did they do? They cried out. I, I think we, we identify with that. Many of us who have lived in the world separated from God, we come to that realization that I'm, I'm sick in my soul. Not, not just that I'm separated from God, but the life that I'm living is destroying me. The life that I'm living is separating me further and further and further from a creator who, who loved me who held me at one time in the, in the hollow of his hand, and I've, I've stepped away from him. And in stepping away, I've become sick. And there's nothing that the world can give me that, 
that makes it better. There's no medicine, there's no food, there's no vitamins and no supplements. There's nothing the world can give me. There's no activities that the world can give me that will take away my sickness. And as many did in the nation of Israel, and many millions have done since those days, they faced those weakest moments of sickness, and they cried out to God in their trouble. And He delivered them from their distress. But notice again how He delivers them. He sent out His Word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. How did He do it? He sent His words. The very words in verse 11 that they rebelled against are the very words that God now sends to them to heal them. To take, away, to take away their sins. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. John 1 and verse 1. In those verses, he's telling us that Jesus is the message by which God was going to save mankind. Peter would tell us in, in 2 Peter 3 verses 5 through 7 that the very Word by which all things were spoken into existence is the very word that keeps the world until the day of judgment. He is the word of creation. He's the word of continuation. And ultimately, he will be the word of destruction, is what Peter is telling us. Because that word is the Son of God. Here again, it is personified as a Savior. God sent his word and healed them. He delivered them from their destruction. How? It was the message of salvation. It was the message that said, if you will come back to me, if you will obey me, I'll save you. I'll take you home. That's the word he promises to us. And even now we recognize that Jesus is that word that became flesh, John 1.14. And that we too are delivered and healed because of his presence and work in our lives. So he says, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love and for his wondrous works to the children of men. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving. Don't just speak the words of thanksgiving, but actually do the actions of thanksgiving. The sacrifice of thanksgiving in verse 22. Tell of his deeds and songs of joy. Think of the song of Moses, the song of Deborah and Barak in Judges chapter 5. Recognizing the work of God in their lives, they begin to praise him and shout out toward him. I think of the angels who are flying around heaven when John sees them in the book of Revelation. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Recognizing his deity and his character and his power in this world. Worthy are you, O Lord. Singing songs that tell of his deeds. And then the fourth one. Some, he says, go down into ships. Doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. He said some, some of them are these, these that, that go out into the world, world and they see the great majesty of God. It is hard to see the power of God in a much more clear way than the, than the storms. From the times that we look out over the water and they're as placid and smooth as glass to the time in which the storm rages and the swells are 20 or 30 feet high. And in, in an instant, how they can change from one to the other Why? Because God is in control. These have gone out into the great waters. These have gone out into the world. These have have interacted with everything the world has to offer, and they are recognizing for the first time the power of God. He commanded and raised the stormy winds in verse 25, which lifted up the waves of the sea, so that they mounted up to the heavens. And then they were dropped down into the valleys. They're on the storm-tossed seas. Matthew chapter 8, the, the disciples 
were on the Sea of Galilee as the, as the winds would come from the north and channel through the, the Jordan River Valley and they would blow across the sea and the waves, the waves would start in an instant. Jesus was sleeping in the boat and, and the disciples are terrified. Why are you sleeping? Do you not care that we're going to perish? And Jesus wakes rebukes them for their faith and says what? Peace, be still. And when he finished speaking that simple phrase, the wave stopped. That's power. He says these have been out there and they've witnessed the power of God, how he can cause the storms to come and the seas to, to, to go through their waves and to undulate, to be lifted to heaven and then brought to the depths and their courage melted away in their plight and they reeled and they staggered like a drunk man and they were at their wit's end. The word wit here refers to their skill, like the navigation skill of those who are, are, you know, in, in the shipping business and merchants. And they've utilized all of their skill. And you know what they couldn't do? They couldn't stop the seas. Oh, they could turn a rudder. They could raise a sail or hoist a sail. And they could drop it down. They could cut a jib or whatever it might have taken. But you know what they couldn't do? They couldn't quit or keep the waves from rolling. They couldn't still the storm. And so what did they do? They cried out to the Lord in their troubles. They, they have done all that they know how to do, and they cannot save themselves. And so they cried to the Lord, and it says, He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. And they were glad the waters were quiet, and He brought them to their desired haven. The one who calms the storm, the one who harbors the ship, is the same one who comes to us in the moments of our trial, in the midst of our trial. When the storms rage in our lives, he is just as willing to deliver us. Just as he was able to take us from the purposeless life to a focused life. Take us from prison to freedom. Take us from sickness to health. And take us from the danger and put us in the safe harbor so let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his run, wondrous works to the children of men. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly. The endangered are rescued. Oh man, I just realized I misspelled rescue. Forgive me. The God of blessings. Who is this God? Who is he? He turns rivers into the desert, springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. God deals with us based upon our obedience to him. If we are willing to obey him and submit to him and love him and call upon him and trust in him, he'll save us. But if we reject him, if we selfishly try to navigate life by ourselves, as we come to our wit's ends, we recognize that God is the one who turns rivers into desert and springs of water into thirsty ground and the fruitful land into a salty waste. It's all because of what we do. He turns the desert into pools of water. He goes the other way too. A parched land into a spring of water. And there he lets the hungry dwell, and they established a city to live in. There's the idea of a city again. They have a city. They've got a land. Remember, he says that, that he gathered them in from the lands. He brought them into his land. It's interesting. In, in, in Psalm 105, in verse 44, it's a, the land becomes part of the promise to them. But in Psalm 106, in verse 3, it becomes part of the punishment to them. They are scattered in the land. And here again, uh, it's now their rescue. They're, they're gathered back into the land. God has brought them in uh, to this promised land, into the city where they dwell. They sow fields and plant vineyards 
and get a fruitful yield. By his blessings, they multiply greatly. He does not let their livestock diminish. Who is it? What's the difference? Those who trust and those who don't. When they are diminished and brought low, through oppression, evil, and sorrow, he pours contempt. Well, who would, who would oppress them? Who would bring them sorrow? Who would do them evil? The princes of the land. Solutions come from God and not government. He says that, that uh, uh, he, he pours contempt on the princes and makes them wander in the trackless waste, but he raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. We see that and we think, oh, well, he's going to, uh, uh, he sees me needy. I'm, I'm poor. I'm in poverty. And we think, well, you know, here in the United States, we're not that poverty. We're not that needy. Uh, the need here is not the need for food. It is not the need for water and shelter. The need here is the need for redemption. It's the need to come out from under the perils of sin. And those who recognize that need and come to God, we are guaranteed that he will rescue us from the exile that we have been in. The upright see it and are glad, and all the wickedness shuts its mouth. Whoever then is wise, let him attend to these things. Let him consider the steadfast love of the Lord. It's not just a psalm of thanksgiving about the steadfast love of the Lord and let the redeemed say so. It's about us becoming wise unto God's presence and God's power in our lives. That he can reach us no matter where we've wandered to. No matter what prison we've been thrown into. No matter what disease haunts us. No matter what storm rages around us. That God is there to reach and to bring us in. And even now there are some who are imperiled. There are some who are fighting sin. There are some who have no direction, and you're wondering. And tonight can be the night that God finds you. In each one of them, they cried out to God. And that's what he's calling on you to do, to cry out to him and to trust him because we can't pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. But we can call upon the Redeemer of the all ages. If tonight you have a need to respond to that call, to call upon Him, to cry out to Him for His deliverance, God is ready to do so for you. But maybe you were that child of God and you're falling away. You've entered the desert. God can redeem you. God can bring you back. If tonight you have a need to respond to His invitation... We invite you to come while we stand and while we sing. Things are ready. Come to the feast. Come to the church to feel the spirit. We famishing ye weary come, and thou shalt be richly fed. Hear the invitation. Whosoever will praise God for full salvation. For whosoever will, all things are ready. Come to the feast. Come while he waits for your welcome ye. Delay not while this day is thine. Tomorrow may never be. Hear the invitation. Come who soever will. Praise God. For full salvation, for whosoever will, all things are ready. Come to the feast, Eve, every care and worldly strife. Come, lay stop on the love of God and drink everlasting life. Hear the invitation.
Come whosoever will, praise God for full salvation, for whosoever will. Sam, we thank you for coming our way tonight, talking to us about our, de our Deliverer, our Heavenly Father. Thank you for coming our way. We enjoyed your lesson. If you would, bow with me. We'll go to our Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and learn more about your word, the praise and the adoration given by the psalmist, shared with us tonight by Sam, directly from your word. We thank you for all of the blessings that you've given to this church, especially your son who came and died for us that we might have eternal life with you in heaven. Father, we ask that you be with those who are traveling overseas now. Help them to 